Good morning, Movement Church. How is everybody this almost afternoon? All right, all right. Bring in the energy, okay? I want you to look to your left and look to your right. That seat will probably be occupied in about 10 or 15 minutes. But uh, hey, to the faithful, to the punctual, we are so glad that you are here and with us this morning. Hey, if we haven't met, my name is Dwayne. I'm one of the pastors here. I would love a chance to meet you, talk with you. Uh, if you are visiting with us, or maybe you've been with us before, but haven't really connected with anyone, hopefully you have stopped by or will stop by our welcome desk. We have a gift that we want to put in your hands. And also, uh, if you are willing, we would love it if you would text new to MC to the number 94,000. If you text us, we promise not to be weird. We're not going to drive to your house or anything like that. But we would love to answer any questions that you might have, give a chance for us to get to know each other just a little bit better. That would be wonderful. And of course, for you veterans that hear me all the time, you know what I'm going to say. If you are here and you invited somebody to come with you, we hope that you have gone to that display out there with all those ping pong balls. You guys, it is getting so tall. We're going to have to figure out, we're going to have to build a secondary backup chamber for the balls to go to because it's filling up. But hey, we hope that you will get one of those blue ping pong balls if you invited somebody to come and see what God's doing here at Movement Church on Midway Boulevard in Port Charlotte. We hope that you will have them write their name on there, drop it in there so that we can celebrate along with you. And if you have been out and about in the places where you live, work, and play, you've been talking to family, to friends, to co-workers, and you have talked to them about the reason for the hope that you have in Jesus, we hope that you will write their name on one of those white ping pong balls and drop those in there so that we can celebrate along with you because this is exciting stuff. The staff, we walk by that display all week long. We walk past the floor and we think, wow, every single one of those represents a life, something that God has done in someone's life. And so we get excited about that. We hope that you're excited about that. Are you excited to worship this morning? Amen. All right. Well, let's stand up. Let's stand up and worship together.
invite you to have a seat for just a moment. Oh, there you are, 8.30 or 11.30. There you are. I see you. Okay. You're here now. All right. Hey, uh, we're going to continue our time of worship together with an opportunity to give. And uh, if you've been walking around campus today, you, you might have noticed that some of the parents of our elementary age students are, are a little bit more chipper, a little bit more awake. They've had a time of rest because their children were at camp all last week. You might notice our kids' ministry team uh, is a little tired, maybe a little. Uh, but uh, you know, our students were at camp this week, and what's really neat, they're gearing up actually for a local uh, wind-shaped camp this week where students will have the opportunity to hear the gospel. But I was, I was talking to Tracy Moss, our kids' ministry director, and she was telling me that six students had made a decision for Christ at camp last week, which is, yeah. Here's the neat part, though. Uh, if you've ever been to a camp, if you, if you haven't, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about your childhood if you didn't get to go to camp when you were a kid. 
But if you went to camp as a kid, you know that there's this, this camp high thing that happens. It's these real big moments. Sometimes it might be a campfire. It might be a particular service where you feel God tugging on your heart and you make a decision. And sometimes you're, as a little guy, especially, you may not even be sure what just happened. But here's what's amazing is that uh, these decisions aren't going to stay there. Uh, our kids ministry team is going to be discipling these students and having conversations with them in the coming days and weeks and months and y'all in the coming years. And so we're so grateful to have a team of people that, uh, that love students or that love children that, that are willing to pour their lives into them. And uh, it's so neat to see what happens at these camps. And I know how important it is because... I was sharing in the last service, there's this beautiful saint, this, this lady that um, she's part of our church, has been for decades. And uh, she may be watching online with us today. She can't drive now, and she, she joins us online if she can't get a ride to church. But I remember when I was a student pastor, she would always come to me right around camp time with her checkbook, and she would tell me, Dwayne, how much does it cost for someone to go to camp? Because I want to make sure that everyone gets an opportunity to go. And she would tell me every year, she would remind me. She said, because you know, Dwayne, I was saved at camp when I was a little girl. God changed my life back then, and it's the reason that I am here today. So I want to make sure nobody misses out. I want to make sure everybody has a chance to have an encounter with Jesus, just like I did all those decades ago. And so I share that because I want you to know that it's your extravagant generosity often that makes it possible. I know that Ms. Tracy told me that uh, because of your generosity, they were able to, to take more students than they had regu- normally anticipated. They were able to get a charter bus instead of having a caravan up and a bunch of different vehicles. They were able to bless some of the counselors that were there with little uh, gift bags and, and things like that to tell them thank you for serving all summer long. They were able to, um, they were able to help kids that didn't have money to go to camp to say, you know what, you don't, it's, we're going to help you. We're, we're going to take care of this. And so thank you for that and creating those opportunities for our little ones to hear about Jesus and to make life changing and generation changing decisions. And that's what you get to be a part of when you give. And so I want to give you that opportunity this morning and let you know if you want to be a part of something like that, this is your chance. And so there are several ways that you can give here at Movement Church. You can use the envelopes that are seat, that are in the seats in front of you. If you look underneath the chairs there, you can drop your gifts uh, in the corner boxes. There are corner offering boxes as you exit there in the foyer. If you'd like to give online, you can do that. There are some instructions behind me. You can text to give. If you're joining us online, a little button will pop up for you to give that way. Uh, but we hope that uh, that when you do, that you will recognize it is an act of worship and the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And we can give cheerfully because we know that God takes those gifts and uses them to do amazing things beyond what we could ever ask or imagine. So would you join me in prayer this morning as we ask God's blessing on this time of worship. Father, thank you that you give us an opportunity to give back just a portion of what you have so generously provided us with so that you could be made famous not just in our town, but in the lives of little ones, uh, in the lives of students, in the lives of adults, God, that you are doing amazing things with the gifts of your people. Thanks for letting us be a part of it, God. We're just going to give you all the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, folks, as we prepare to continue in worship, I'm going to ask you to stand, and I want to let you know that as you do, um, when we begin this song, if you need prayer this morning, if you'd like uh, someone to pray over you for anything, if there's a, something that you have coming up or you would just want to thank the Lord for what he's doing in your life and you want to share it with somebody, there are going to be some prayer partners. They'll be moving even now to the corners, the four corners of the room here. So they'll have those blue lanyards on. If you'd like some prayer during these songs, just, just come on up. We would love to pray over you and bless you this morning. All right, let's worship together.
saints and the elders in glorious song and the praise.
before the throne of God above. I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love. Whoever lives and pleads for extent of your love the, the frame of reference that we have is that right John three sixteen, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him may not perish but instead have eternal life our frame of reference is the sacrifice of Christ on the cross and yet sometimes I wonder if even even we can't really understand what that type of love even means and there's just so much more depth that awaits us in heaven when we walk into the throne room and get to be sinless, unshackled, unhindered with the angels 
and the saints and the elders singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who was, who is, and is to come. And so, Lord, I long for that day to really know the depths of your love. And I long for that day where the sin that clings so closely is in the past and never again. And so, Lord, our hope lies in you. And Lord, I ask that these truths that we have sang just take root in our hearts, that it influence our actions, our words, our deeds, how we think, how we talk, as we are emissaries of your Son in this broken world. So we pray these things in the matchless name of Jesus, the name above all names, and God's people said, amen. 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 What a beautiful hymn of reminder to each and every one of us in Christ Jesus this morning. Amen. Those words that struck me this morning. I bow before the cross of Christ and marvel at his love divine. God's perfect son was sacrificed to make me righteous in God's eyes. I pray that that would be a reality that constantly stays close to the very depths of our heart. Amen? That we would cling to that with everything that we are. Well, I am uh, excited that we get to gather together this morning as we wrap up our look at Jonah. Jonah, the reluctant prophet. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get this out of the way so you're not wondering the whole time. Yes, I have been sick as a dog uh, this past week. I promise you that I sound way worse than I feel. Um, I, I'm still going to try to keep away from you as much as possible. But that said, I'm going to preach a little bit more slowly than I normally do uh, with maybe not the same intensity. But I promise if you amen I'll do better. <laughs> Y'all going to pull it out of me, aren't you? This one's going to hurt. <laughs> All right. We are wrapping up this look at Jonah. And for those who maybe haven't been with us the past few weeks, maybe, uh, maybe you've been on vacation. Uh, maybe Oh, thank you so much. Maybe you've been on vacation. Uh, perhaps you, you've been under the weather yourself. Who knows? Whatever the case. Uh, let me just, just give you a little bit of background so we can get to the same place this morning. So Jonah receives a word from the Lord. He willingly disobeys God, refuses to go and preach to the people of Nineveh, which God had instructed him to go to. He hops on a boat to go the other way. God sends a storm. Storm kicks up. Uh, Jonah ends up in the water, uh, falling down in the water. He gets eaten by... Uh, a very large fish that apparently doesn't chew his meals very well. Still don't understand how that worked out. But anyway, he cries out to God from the belly of said fish and says, Okay, God, I'll do whatever it is you want. Uh, God gives the fish a case of acid reflux and bleh, uh, Jonah ends up out on the shore. So that's where we find him as the word of the Lord comes to Jonah. A second time. And so Jonah goes and does as the Lord instructs. And the people of Nineveh repent. Praise God. Amen. That's what we see in chapter 3, verse 10. When God saw what they, the Ninevites, did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them. And he did not do it. And they all lived happily ever after. <laughs> right? You remember how we started the book of Jonah uh, with this really presentation that oftentimes Jonah gets relegated to the land of uh, storybooks and veggie tales. And that's why we often think of Jonah and the Right, Jonah and the whale. Those storybooks that do happen to go beyond just Jonah and a big fish. Uh, th this is where the proverbial plane lands, is right here. 
that the people of Nineveh repented and God said, this is great. And they all lived happily ever after. In fact, if you're like, well, I don't know about that. I want to show you. These are actual storybook endings to the story of Jonah. This one right here, Jonah went to Nineveh. He taught the people there. Let's be clear. Somebody's being very generous with this version. (laughs) Jonah wasn't doing a whole lot of teaching, okay? But Jonah taught the people there. And the people of Nineveh listened. They started following God again. And they all lived happily ever after. How about this one? Here's another one. This one wraps, I like this one. It wraps up with some application for us. It says, when I make a wrong choice, I can repent and try again. God loved Jonah and God loves me too. Great message. I love that. That's beautiful. We should be teaching uh, a generation these truths. How about one more? This was a comic book version. I like this one. Jonah told the people of Nineveh how much God loved them. The people were so glad to hear about God. Yay. (laughs) And that's the end of the comic. There's only one problem. It's not the end of the book of Jonah. Jonah goes, he shares this story. The people of Nineveh repent. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. So what we witness today is the true ending of the story. What we witness today is very likely going to be a point of both contention and connection for almost every single one of us in this room or online. Because what we're going to witness today is that through all of this, Jonah still lands in this place of demonstrating to us the beating of a reluctant heart. That when God does what only God can do, sometimes to our great displeasure, we find ourselves in this odd place of being really upset that God did what he did. That we demonstrate, just as Jonah will for us today, a reluctant heart. Now, the notes today, to to be clear, are light. Go ahead and take a peek at them. You'll see there's not as many blanks as normal. And I'm going to take a sip while you do that. You didn't look. That wasn't long enough. Give me more time. That's hot. But we're going to continue. The notes are light for a reason. Because it's an opportunity for us to maybe just pause and listen to Jonah a bit. Because we do want to remember, right? We want to praise Jonah for what is good. And that is that this was a man that whether it was through his own authorship or whether it was through oral tradition passed down over the generations, he chose to ensure that this story persisted so that other generations might hear it, so that we might hear it and learn from it. So that's what we really want to do today. And the first thing that we see in these lighter-than-normal notes is the beating of a reluctant heart It is really... Uh, at the center of it, what fuels it, what drives it, is anger. The beating of a reluctant heart, fueled by anger. That's what's going on in Jonah's life right now. Go preach to the Ninevites. Ugh, whatever, God. He goes and preaches, preaches to the Ninevites. God doesn't destroy them. Jonah's angry. And you might say, well, Nate, that seems a little bit heavy-handed. You know, to say that Jonah was, like, angry. I mean, maybe he was disappointed. It said he was displeased. I mean, it might be a little heavy, except for verse 1. It says he was mad. This displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was In the Hebrew, this word right here is angry. We talked about this word before, uh, especially in the context of when God looks down on his people and is displeased with something they have done. 
right? It's the flaring of the nostrils. You've been that mad before, right? Your kids will tell you when they're that mad. They're like, why are your nostrils flaring? Uh, That's what's going on here. Amen. Jonah is upset. He is mad about this whole thing. Now, uh, the, the only way I can connect this, how Jonah is feeling in this moment about what's going down, is to take you back uh, to my childhood. Being uh, one of three siblings, we've talked about my siblings throughout the series because it just fits really well. One of my absolute favorite things growing up is when my mom or dad would say to me those treasured words, Sean, Nathaniel, go and tell your brother we need to see him now. Oh, what joy. It's like Christmas. That's, and y'all are like, that's warp, Nate. What's wrong with you? Stop judging me. We're family. Let's not have trust issues amongst us. Listen, they would look at me and say, whether it was my brother or my sister, when they would say, Nathaniel, you're the closest one nearby. You need to go and tell your sibling, we need to see them now. And so I would run with enthusiasm, y'all, with a spring in my step, obedience like you've never seen in your life. I would bound up those stairs saying, yes, Papa, I'll be happy to. (laughs) Up the stairs I would go, knock on my brother's door, open it, and say, Josh, what do you want? Mom and Dad want to see you now. (laughs) That's how they said it, two syllables, now. (laughs) And then they would go and meet with my parents, and hope would spring eternal within me because I knew they were going to get it. And then I would eavesdrop, not eavesdrop, I would take disciplinary educational notes for myself. (laughs) Listen in. And I would hear them say... Josh, we love you very much. And we don't want you to make this mistake again. What's going on? And and here's the thing. We know this has caused you a lot of issues. What is happening? These are not the notes I'm supposed to be taking. And then those dreaded words. We think you've learned your lesson. Don't let this happen again. Are you kidding me right now? That's it? That's how the, we need to see your brother now. Turns into, we love you very much, and we know you've learned your lesson. I was furious when that happened as a kid. And see, we may laugh at this, but that's Jonah in this moment. Jonah, in this moment, is literally angry because he's saying, you're going to do something? You you aren't going to take care of these horrible, miserable people? Jonah's attitude toward the Ninevites is more than one marked by justice. It's one bursting with anger. Now, let's frame this properly for a moment, though, because we need this if we're going to understand the totality of what's going on. History, as we mentioned last week, history has marked for us that Nineveh was not just a random, uh, sinful city, right? In all of its beauty and its glory and its majesty, this is a a piece of art called the Monuments of Nineveh. It was by uh, Sir Austin Henry Layard back in 1853, but... Nineveh was not just a random city. It was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, an empire that, as we talked about already, alluded to, made continuous campaigns against the tribes of the northern kingdom and eventually the entire nation of Israel. They slaughtered and took into captivity 
hundreds of thousands of Jewish people. So let's be clear. These were terrorists. You have to be with me on this, okay? Told the first service, we all had to kind of massage this a little bit. You've got to be with me on this right here. The people that Jonah didn't want to preach to, the people that God spared in his mercy, were terrorists. Are you with me? These were not just people with whom Jonah disagreed on some social, economic, or political issue. These were terrorists. These were horrible people. And and so, the primary fuel for Jonah's anger and frustration, hear me, was that God was showing mercy to a country, to a nation, more specifically, God was showing mercy to a people that Jonah saw as an enemy to his own people. Let that settle for a second. Got it? We okay? Nobody's going to cut me yet? Don't worry, we'll get there. So Jonah got stuck. His heart got stuck. What do I mean by that? He had become, here's where we're going to kind of, somebody said to me this morning, it's probably good that you were sick because maybe it made this message a little more tolerable. Uh, Amen. Jonah was stuck because he had become so civically and emotionally aligned with the interests of his people that he lacked compassion for any other people not of his tribe. He didn't want these enemies of Israel to be spared. And to be fair, Clayton, we get it, right? These were horrible people. To be more honest, We do this, right? We have our tribes. We have our groups. And and we stand in such staunch, solid alignment with them that we sometimes fail to have any sort of compassion or any other. I'm going to state it more plainly. We have our tribes socially. Right? White collar, blue collar. I mean, this, this has gone on for generations. Just a... That's what it sounds like. Did you know? The back and forth. I mean, why, and it's, I get it. It's a small thing. But it's your, you're not my tribe. Let's take it a step further. We have our tribes economically and politically. Right? Can we lean into this this morning? Can we? We need to be very careful of this in the church. Very careful. We claim Christianity, but our religion is Republican. Don't worry, I'm going to offend everybody. Just calm down. (laughs) Because it's what I do. We claim Christianity, but our devotion is Democrat. We... We will stand as kingdom citizens, proudly declaring the importance of missions, stating the Alliance Creed, all of Jesus for all the world, while at the same time, out of the same mouth, speaking disparagingly of other nations and peoples.
us versus them. That was Jonah. Jonah's a picture for us of this. Is anybody else uncomfortable? I'm sweating. I don't know if it's sickness or y'all staring at me like I'm going to die after this. As long as it's us versus them. Hear me, as long as it is my tribe is somehow superior to your tribe, my people are better than your people, we will never become the full expressions of God's mercy and messengers of his truth that we were intended to be. We never will. We'll never carry out his kingdom purpose, but maybe, maybe like Jonah, our anger has so blinded us that we don't want them to experience the mercy of God. We've placed them in their box, and that's where they'll stay till they, till they burn. Not only is a reluctant heart fueled by anger, it's full of arrogance. Look at, uh, look at this in verse 2. It says, it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry, and he prayed to the Lord and said, this is what I love, catch this, displeased Jonah, he was angry, and he prayed to the Lord, pause, another thumbs up for Jonah, seriously, we don't have a lot of them, but we want to take them where we can get them, he was angry, and he prayed to the Lord, friend, when you're experiencing anger about the way you feel God has handled something in your world, the best thing you can do is talk to him about it. We need to pause and say, Jonah, that's great. Because I think many times in the church, we've taken anger as a signal to pull back from God instead of anger as a signal to lean into God. That, that that anger should be a pain point for us to say, cry out to him, fuss with him, fight with him. God's not surprised by your anger, nor is he offended by it. It's okay for you to express these, these emotions with him and to him. So let, let's pause and say, good job, Jonah. So he prayed to the Lord and said, kind of gets a little squirrely from here, but that's okay. Because prayers can be honest, believe it or not. He prayed to the Lord and said, listen to this. Oh, Lord, is this not what I said when I was still in my country? This is our indicator that there was a whole lot more going on in this conversation that isn't necessarily recorded for us, okay? You remember how we talked about this a couple weeks back. This tells us more happened than we have recorded because Jonah says, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? means there was some kind of exchange where God said, Go to Nineveh. And Jonah said, no, I'm not going to Nineveh because I know what you're going to do. And God was like, no, you're going to Nineveh. I don't want to go to Nineveh. That's fine. So this was happening. What was it that Jonah said would happen? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. Hold on to that. <coughs> For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. I want to pause for a moment because this is a great example of why context matters when you read Scripture. Because if we just took this portion right here, for I knew, Jonah said, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Put that on a plaque, cross-stitch it, put it in a worship song. That is glorious right there. Is it not? Look, look at those words. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. But that ain't how Jonah said it. That's why we need context to understand the text. Because the context tells us that it was probably something more along these lines. That's why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew 
that you're a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. See the difference? We can all relate to this. God spares the people of Nineveh, and Jonah puffs up and says, literally, I knew you would pull this stunt. I knew that you were going to do this. And catch this, he even justifies his actions. I knew you would do this. That's why I ran. That's that's the whole reason that I scooted on along. In other words, Jonah, in his arrogance, is saying, I had to run because I knew if I didn't, this would be the outcome. I knew I had to do it. And he even has, this is what's fascinating about these words, he even has so much arrogance that he quotes Scripture back to God. These are the words of Moses from Exodus 34. That you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to anger and filled with unfailing love. And where Moses uses those words as a means of praising and describing God, Jonah is using them in arrogance, arrogance and argument. It's arrogance at its best. It is this idea of Don't you know they didn't deserve that? A few years ago, my crew and I were heading into uh, a show. It was a general admission show, kind of a, and it was a theater in the round setup. Y'all know, have you ever been in that kind of really cool, kind of intimate atmosphere? Um, It wasn't chairs, though. It was set up with like stadium style bleachers all around. And because it was general admission, They filed you in and were filling a section at a time, and it just so happens we we weren't the first in the line, but we were we were far enough in that they filled up this one section, and it didn't look like there was quite enough room. They would fill it from the front to the back. It didn't look like there was quite enough room up there for the rest of my crew to fit. And so the guy goes, You know what? Come on. I'll, I'll put you right over here. And we got to be in the front row of the next section. Yes, it was perfect. Sitting right there. We're at ground level. The only thing in front of us is like some designated uh, handicap space for wheelchairs and uh, ECVs and their families and stuff like that. We're like, this is perfect. We'll have a great view. We're right here on the front row. Two minutes before the show starts, (coughs) in comes this lady. Like, she just owns the place. You know, she's got Blaze and Brittany, her two little perfect kids, and she waltzes in, and, oh, we can't find a seat. Where's the seat? Oh, here's the seat, and plops herself down on the bench directly in front of my family that's reserved for handicapped people. She just sits herself right there. It's like, I'm going to watch the show from here. And I looked at my wife, and my wife goes, (laughs) I said, I looked at her, I said, seriously? And the lady heard it, because I wanted her to. Uh, I told you, I'll just pray for you, Pastor. Uh, to, and, and she turns around and she goes, what's your problem? And, and Michelle, turned, mm, mm, mm. and I, ah, and the Holy Spirit, don't you dare. And it just locked down on me. So all I said was, well, ma'am, these are actually reserved for for." handicapped folks and their families. Now, did I care one bit about handicapped folks and their families? No. I just wanted her fat head out of my view. That's what I wanted. Some of y'all are like, I'm never coming back to this church again. I've repented since. Calm down. I repented that day. But I wanted her out of the way. I was like, man, those are, it's for handicapped people. I don't know what to say. So what does she do? She gets up. She goes over to this guy. This guy that, you know, sat my family here. And I'm thinking, oh, he's, you know, he's going to look out for us. He put us on this road. He's not going to let this lady who's not handicapped sit here. 
She walks over and says, well, you know, I, there's no one else to sit. And my kids wanted to see the show. And, you know, it's okay if there's, there's, there's nobody up there. And he goes, yes, ma'am, it's okay. <laughs> what is happening? Are you kidding me right now? This is, this is not okay. I am not good with this, right? I was, you would have been furious too. You've been there. You've been in that situation. We've all experienced something like that before. What, you know, someone let us in in traffic and then we're like, oh no, you're not getting in. Whatever the case, we've all experienced something similar to it. Because in that moment, what I was wrestling with was I didn't like that this individual in this moment where I had received a certain seat from the person in authority, now that same person of authority allowed another person to have a similar, if not slightly better seat than I previously had. And so I was upset. Why? Because I, I deserve this, not her. That's kind of what's going on here. Because here's the thing. Go check out chapter 2. Chapter 2, Jonah had no problem praying that God would deliver him from the depths of the sea. No issue. He had no problem crying out to God, deliver me from the depths of the sea. From the belly of Sheol, I cried, and you heard my voice. Jonah had no problem crying out that God would save his one soul but was furious when God delivered tens of thousands from certain destruction. Well, yeah, I deserve it. But them? Them? Who's the them in your life? Who, who's the them? The people group party. Remember that was our last assignment last week that I know we all did when we went home. Who, who is the them for you? That, that's, what, that's what Jonah is saying here, this arrogant posture. I'm better than them. And so here's the thing. The result, it's though not always intentional, it's still arrogance. God needs me to show them God needs me to set them straight. Otherwise, he's just going to show compassion. Big knucklehead. <laughs> God's just going to do what God does. So catch this. We've been waiting on this for four weeks. Why did Jonah run? He tells us Jonah's reluctance to go to Nineveh was not primarily, it was not about, what they would do to him, but what God might not do to them. He was never reluctant to go preach to the Ninevites because he was afraid they would kill him. He was reluctant to go preach to the Ninevites because he was afraid God wouldn't kill them. And this is the point. I'll make this more personal because this is a hard message. I know it is. <coughs> when I see someone far from God, even someone not of my tribe, and you know what I mean by that, let's not pretend that we don't. You all have a tribe that's not yours that you would really, really be okay just leaving them to whatever eventual fate may be awaiting them. When I see someone, even someone not of my tribe, who is far from God, my first response should not be to somehow present myself to God as better than them. It should be to present to them the God who made me far better than I ever could have been on my own. That should be 
the message, to present to them the one who has made me holy, who has made me righteous, who has made me forgiven, who has made me clean, who has made me accepted, who has made me adopted, who has transformed me. Because hear me, anything less than that is arrogance. And it implies that only certain people are worthy of God's mercy. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't twist this. I should have clarified this in the first service. That doesn't mean that there's not still the responsibility of repentance for those who receive that message. This isn't a blanket mercy coverage, okay? But that should be our message. Because we know in Jonah's story, in his interactions, that God was concerned for people. Look, look back at Jonah 3. We, we underlined this last week. This phrase right here, I'm going to underline it again for you today. It says this, So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. That's what we underlined last week, okay? The reason I had you do this is it's important. Is there something interesting happening in the Hebrew language with that word right there? Exceedingly occurs in the text a couple of times, but in this case it's unique because where it says now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, this is the word of the Lord coming to Jonah. That phrase in the Hebrew is ir gadol elohim. So city uh, ir uh, gadol, I'm not going to spell it out right now, and elohim. Now, that might sound familiar, ir gadol elohim, because uh, it means a city great unto God. Elohim. Right? Mark Yarborough, who we've uh, used as one of our supporting uh, authors and scholars throughout these past few weeks, he says, interestingly, a literal translation would say of the Hebrew that Nineveh was a great city important unto God. Why? Why would Nineveh, a terrorist city, be important to God? That's why. God cares about people. I didn't do this last service. Thank you, Jesus. God cares about whoever your them is. Friend, God cares about them. And you need to be very, very aware and cautious how you speak of them because they are someone he wants to redeem. Not the most fun message. I hope you'll come back next week. God cared about Nineveh. In God's sight, listen to Yarborough. Nineveh was great because it had people. Acknowledgement. Yes, they were wicked and evil. Amen? That was your best chance. I'm just going to be straight. That's where you got to go. Yeah, get them. They were wicked and evil. Yes, they had problems. Yes, they abused other people and were immoral, but God cared for them. This was the reason Jonah was sent to Nineveh. But a reluctant heart is fueled by anger. It's full of arrogance. And then we close Jonah's story with this. It's fixed on destruction. I want to concede something here. If this word is too heavy for you, 
perhaps you could replace it with this downfall. Because I don't want the word destruction to distract you from how this particular part of Jonah's story might connect more deeply with you. Okay? So maybe downfall is a, is a better word to help us wrap our hearts and minds around this. But look at verse 2. I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, relenting from disaster. Jonah knew this before he went with his message. A message that, mind you, remember, was Jonah focused on, you will be overthrown, you will be done. No hidden messages, nothing to dig through. Jonah was set on their demise. He was excited about it. You ever been excited about taking somebody down? You have, right? Because we're all a little broken inside. No, no, no. I think it, here, let me, let me make it simple. Uh, if you say, no, I've never, I've never experienced that. I bet you have if you've played this game. <laughs> there it is. All right, good. I knew, I knew. You're like, I've never, I've never celebrated someone's demise before. Oh, Monopoly? Shoot, yeah, brother. Now, listen, a few years back, <coughs> my kids were playing this game, uh, all, all of us, the whole family. And uh, it, it had really boiled down to there were two heavy players kind of left at the table, um, and one just kept breaking the other every time around the board. And it got to this place because one of the players, uh, who I, want, I won't name, but their name rhymes with a romantic city in France. Um, some of you will get that later. You'll be like, oh, that's who that was. But anyway, she, ooh, I gave more away. Uh, she had decided to become the slumlord of Go Row. Y'all know what I'm talking about? So the, 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 that's the property nobody wants. You, you're talking it right here. You got like Mediterranean. Who wants Mediterranean? That thing earns you like a dollar if somebody lands on it. Nobody wants it unless you're a slumlord. And then you figure it out real fast. And slumlord, who rhymes with Paris, uh, she, she had built out this entire row. It was all hers. She had bought house upon house upon house. Then she got her hotels set in place. And then another child who was playing, whose name might be synonymous with promised land, was coming all the way around the board. My daughter looks at him because she's just counted up. And she said, you're about to roll a seven. You're going down. <laughs> Ask my wife. That is not an over-exaggeration. It was the creepiest thing I've ever experienced in my life. <laughs> rolls the dice. Kid you not, dude rolls a seven. <laughs> Lands on one of her properties that's fully developed, and she goes, <laughs> You're done! That's how she said it. It was terrifying. And she was thrilled about this. She had been waiting for this very moment. I showed him. I got him. Jonah's experiencing some similar emotions in this moment. He's at this place where he thinks, I've preached this message, and, and God, boy, we're going to show them. We lit them up, didn't we? Here's the irony of the whole thing. Didn't give this to you in the first week because it's best to catch it in the end. Jonah's name, the prophet's name, literally means peace. It's dove. Jonah means dove or peace. And yet, if God had destroyed that city, Jonah would have gone home delighted. That didn't happen. And Jonah is so fixated on their demise that he says, if you won't kill them, kill me. Now, I, I, we need to pause for a moment. Because I don't want us, I think sometimes we can read these these stories from antiquity, 
And like we can gloss over how broken and painful these words are. This is a man who's gone from a place of like disobedience and kind of disruption in his heart. This is a man who's full on in the depths of despair and depression. This is not a small thing. And I say that because we as a church are going to be taking a journey this fall where we actually talk about some of these things and the importance in, in God's heart of our mind and our heart being in alignment and how he wants mental wellness for our lives. So I think it's important for us to not just gloss over how serious this moment is for Jonah. He's in despair. And listen, this is a key indicator for us of why that earlier interaction where where he said, just throw me in the sea, what was the initial iteration of this right here? It was Jonah saying, remember, he said, I knew you were going to do this. So on that boat, he was saying, I'd rather die than go preach to them. Here it is, him saying it out loud to God in prayer. Because it's better for me to die than to live. I would rather perish than see these people saved. Jonah misses the message. In verse 4, the Lord says this. Do you do well to be angry? Now to be clear... In a sense, Jonah was being told by God, do you really have a right to be angry? Do you really have a leg to stand on? But understand where some translations do word it that way, it's important that we catch that this is probably a more accurate translation. Do you do well to be angry? In other words, God is saying, Jonah, how is this good for you? How is this good for us? Do you not see how broken this is? How you viewed these people that I I care about. And so God uses an object lesson. The remainder of the text, verse 5 through 10, goes like this. Jonah goes to sit and sulk at the east side of the city, maybe hoping that God would somehow smoke them all anyway. In the blistering heat of the day, the scorching sun bearing down, God miraculously causes a shade tree to spring forth and to provide Jonah a shade in his discomfort. God still caring for his rebellious, reluctant prophet. God causes that shade tree to spring forth. The next morning, God sends a worm to destroy the same plant, and Jonah is ticked. God says, Jonah, does it it upset you? Yeah. God says, Jonah, are you right to be upset about the plant that you did nothing to nurture or cause to grow? Jonah says, yes. God says, so you're sad the plant is destroyed. Jonah says, yeah, yeah, I am. This is my best friend. (laughs) There were no volleyballs available. Some of you need to look it up. He says, yeah, I'm upset. I can't believe you destroyed this plant. God's like, "Uh, okay. Jonah, I care about those people more than a plant. God wanted to redeem them. I know this might be hard to hear, but God wants to redeem the wicked. You know how I know that? Ezekiel chapter 18. Where God says to another prophet, do I take pleasure in the death of the wicked? Says the Lord God, certainly not. If they change their ways, they will live. Hmm. Same thing here. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much livestock? The end. This is a book of the month. That's the worst ending ever. That's garbage. What is it? This is me talking, not Jonah. This is like Inception. Did did the top fall or did it keep spinning? What's going on? You can't just leave us here. This is weird. Who ends the book like that? It's not weird. You know why? Because Jonah is one of those books that reaches 
forward into the future through the ages. And it challenges us today with one simple question. Can we get okay with God going after our worst enemies? Can we get okay, friend, with God going after them? And not the way we hoped. Not the that made the fleas of 10,000 camels infest their armpits. Not that version of going after them. The version of going after them that is with great compassion, relentless love, and redemption. Amen? What if we clung to the words of the great pastor, preacher, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who said, If sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions, and let not one go unwarned and unprayed for. Whether they're a Democrat, whether they're a Republican, whether they're rich, they're poor, white collar, blue collar, what their background is, what their preferences are, or what their gender pronouns are. How about we just start preaching Jesus to people that God wants to transform? Because I was them. You were them. Amen. Father, we love you. And we thank you for this time in your presence. As we leave from here, I pray that I would be more in tune, less reluctant, more ready and willing. Take the message of hope to those who need to hear. We love you. We praise you. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. We love you so much. Praying for you this week as you are the hands and feet of Jesus to those around you. Amen.